So, ladies and gentlemen, Hans Hoppe has kindly invited me to speak to you on the subject of the global bell curve. So we will come to this in a minute or two. But first of all, I must explain what is this thing, the global bell curve? Well, uh, let's get rid of this term global. And I'll explain the bell curve. The bell curve describes the distribution of intelligence in a population. Uh, within a population, some people are intelligent, other people are unintelligent. And this is distributed rather like height, according to a bell curve. Some people are tall and other people are short. What is this intelligence? Intelligence is the ability to learn rapidly, sometimes difficult material, and retain this, and also the ability to solve problems when they're presented to you. And so some people are better at this, intelligent people and other people are not so good at it. Uh, intelligence is uh, ordered by psychologists on a average or mean of 100, and most people fall between 70 and 130. 2% of the population fall below 70, these are the mentally retarded, and another 2% of the population fall above 130. So these are the really intelligent people, or that is to say, people like ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> so that is intelligence. So what has this got to, why should you be interested in this? What has this got to do with this question here? Well, my agenda has been to integrate what psychologists have discovered about intelligence with a problem which uh, economists and other social scientists have been concerned with for decades and even centuries, which is this problem here, posed by David Lang. So why are we so rich and they so poor? Well, who are we and who are they? Well, we are the white peoples who are rich, and they who are poor are the brown peoples and the black peoples, and that is the problem which economists have been concerned with, and as I say, also historians here. Now, our leftist friends have a standard answer to this problem. They say, the reason is that we whites are not very nice people, and we discriminate against the browns and the blacks. We don't really like them, so we, uh, we don't give them jobs, so they remain poor. Well, if there's legislation to ensure that we do have to give them jobs, well, we only give them low-level jobs where they're poorly paid. And once we've got them in employment, we don't promote them, so they remain poorly paid. So that is a standard leftist social science answer to this question, wherever it's raised in any countries, and it's because there are a lot more of these people, that is the uh, general consensus view, I suppose, in social science. Nevertheless, there are people who have dissented from this. Um, they say, uh, no, no, we don't uh, dislike these people, we're not prejudiced against them, it's not that. Um, the problem is, the problem lies in them, they have some deficit. Uh, something inside them that stops them uh, earning as much money as we do. And we even had the President Barack Obama take this very view a few months ago when he addressed the black youth in the United States. And he said, look, I know what the attitude is very prevalent among you lads. You don't like working in school. You think that's a whitey thing, working in school. So you dissociate your so from it, but that's all wrong. You should be working like I did and Michelle. We worked hard at school. You should adopt us as your role model. You work hard and then you'll do like us and maybe get to Harvard or some lesser place perhaps, but nevertheless you'll do well. So uh, change your attitude, boys. That was his message, so evidently he's on our side in this issue. Well, there is this minority of social scientists generally right-wing social scientists who say that the answer to this problem is not that we discriminate against these peoples, but they have some deficit. The nature of this deficit is not very widely explored, so my agenda is to 
promote the idea that this is a, an intelligence deficit. And the reason that we are rich and they are poor is that we are more intelligent than they are. Now this view was you can you could uh, adopt uh, you, can, you can tackle this problem yeah within countries take one country like the United States or whatever or you can look at it between countries and say well why are the European peoples rich and these other nations brown-skinned and black-skinned nations poor and this by um, the global bell curve which I have here uh, the publisher is with us today Richard uh, Spencer, if anyone would want to look at this in detail. Uh, this is really a sequel, the Global Bell Curve, to the book called, just called The Bell Curve by Richard Hernstein and Charles Murray, published in 1994. In that book, they presented a racial hierarchy in the United States of IQs of the different racial and ethnic groups, and then they presented the earnings and similar related phenomena, socioeconomic status, educational attainment of the races. Now, the results of that, set out in that book, was the fact that the Jews are the people with the highest IQ. They have an IQ of 110, and, and the highest earnings, the highest socioeconomic status, uh, other indices of intellectual attainment, winning Nobel Prizes and everything. Below them come the Northeast Asians, the Chinese, the uh, Koreans and the Japanese, they IQ of 105, they do the next best, then come the whites, IQ of 100, then quite a, quite a long drop here to the Hispanics with their IQs of uh, 87 and below them the blacks. We get a complete uh, <coughs> linear relationship between these variables. As so I said, well, we, we, this is the answer to this problem. Uh, the reason some people do better is they're more intelligent than others. So this is my, my, uh, the subject of this presentation, the global bell curve examines this question all over the world, hence the global. And then the question is, does this, does this same hierarchy appear elsewhere in the world? And the answer is that it does. We look, I look at some 14 nations or aggregations of nations, like Latin America, Caribbean. We find the same hierarchy everywhere, wherever you look. It's always the Mongoloid peoples, as we call them in classical anthropology, the Japanese, Chinese, and Chinese, who, together with the European peoples, who come to the top of these hierarchies, wherever they are, and then the brown peoples, quite often mixed race peoples, such as Latin America or Caribbean, or the mulattoes, white, uh, black mixes, mestizos, white Native American Indians mixes, and then we have uh, the pure blacks and whites come at the bottom of these hierarchies. And we see that everywhere, as I say, in the Caribbean, variants of this, uh, these hierarchies appear in different places, for example in Southeast Asia, uh, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Thailand. We have, apart from in Singapore, we have smallish minorities of Chinese, but they have much more, they're much more intelligent than the indigenous populations. So they do much better in terms of earnings and possession of wealth, control of the banks and the big companies. They do much better, even though they're quite small minorities of the population. In Indonesia, about 2% of the population, but then in Thailand, they're about 10% of the population, but they're still immensely powerful. So this is rather discomforting to the, dis the discrimination problem. Uh, the discrimination answer to this problem it's not possible for 2% of the population in Indonesia to discriminate against the uh, native peoples. They're not powerful enough, nor even in Thailand, but it's just through their own abilities that they've acquired this powerful position. So, uh, some 10 years ago, uh, I decided with uh, Tatu Van Hannen, my collaborator in Finland, a political economist, to uh, collaborate with him to examine this question of whether the same uh, the differences would appear when we look at nations, not within nations, but we look at nations. So the division of labor here was that uh, Tati Van Hannan would do all the economic uh, detail of it and I would gather the IQs of nations to see, then we would look at the two and see whether the IQs of nations would predict the per capita incomes of the populations of these nations, just as is the case within nations. So, um, 
I can move on here. Actually. Well. Anyone know how to work this thing? Hang on. Hang on. <coughs> Hang on. Okay. So I could, as a result of, I collected IQs from all over the world, and I summarize these in this IQ world map. Uh, and the uh, this IQs of nations are set on 100 for Britain, and uh, these are the slightly, uh, uh, the, uh, all the, your European nations have an IQ of around 100. It's the same metric as we use within nations. The, uh, if you see that uh, China is a bit darker red, and same is true of these other mongoloid peoples in Japan, Taiwan, and South Korea, and uh, Singapore, they have an IQ of 105, exactly the same difference as is found within nations in the United States. So they, these mongoloid peoples, I know there are one or two present, but I speak uh, so for our European audience here, they're a bit more intelligent than we are. Uh, and then we have a band running across North Africa into the uh, Middle East, uh, India, through to uh, Southeast Asia, where the IQ is about 85. And it drops to sub-Saharan Africa of around 70. Then these, uh, these IQs of 100 are present among the European peoples wherever they are, in North America, in Australia, and in the southern parts of South America, in Argentina and Uruguay and Chile. They're all about the same. As you go north from uh, Brazil, Ecuador, Paraguay, and these places up into Mexico, the IQs dropped because these are mixed race peoples, generally with white minorities, and uh, so it's a kind of average depending on how much the, what the mix is in these places. So, so having got, we've got the IQs, contributed by me, we've got the per capita incomes, contributed by my collaborator, Tatu Van Hannan, and we run the correlation of these two, we found this correlation about 0.68. I, uh, the IQs explain quite a lot, but by no means the totality of these differences between nations in per capita income. I just been reminding you of, uh, of course, as I was saying, the discussion of this problem goes back centuries, and uh, Adam Smith, of course, was concerned with this problem in his famous book, uh, The Wealth of Nations, in which he said uh, one of the things that determines why some countries are rich and some are poor is that some countries have a well-functioning market economy with the rule of law and property rights and attendant constituents of a well-functioning market economy. Those countries do well and are rich. These countries that have various kinds of poorly functioning market economies are poor. So we can all live with that. There's no problem with that. And this is another uh, major contributor, uh, of course, to why uh, the answer to this question, why are some countries rich and others poor? So we see really there are two major factors that determine whether a country is rich or poor or somewhere in between. One is they have a well-functioning market economy. The other is that they have high or low IQs. So, so it's our this is our general conclusion here. We'll access it out here. We also add in natural resources as uh, some rather more minor component, but in some cases, a very an important contributor to the wealth and poverty of nations. Or some countries like Kuwait, an obvious example. Their IQ is quite modest. They have that well-functioning market economy but they're very oil rich, so they have a per capita income just much the same as we have in uh, Western Europe. Um, and the, I, the correlation across nations between IQ at, uh, and GNI, strictly speaking gross national income, at PPP, uh, purchasing power parity, is the correlation of 0.68, meaning IQ contributes about half the variability in uh, per capita income. 
So uh, we think we have uh, achieved here an integration of the social sciences of economics and psychology. As Hans Hoppe said in his introductory remarks this morning, uh, economics is the queen of the social sciences. So that's fine, I'm very happy with that. And I say psychology is the king of the social sciences. <laughs> This, but this is, uh, I'm not implying that the king is in any way superior to the queen. This is a marriage between equals, and we hope that uh, we have brought them together. This will be a successful marriage, and they will have many progeny will be produced as a result of this uh, uh, integration of the, these two sister social sciences. Now, there have been some, particularly our friends on the political left, have not been very happy with this analysis. Uh, it's all, you know, more IQs. These are, you say, these are genetically based with many of these IQs. So, so this means there are genetic differences between these peoples. Well, that's not very good news for us. Or we, we, we aspire to a world in which everyone is equal. Or at any rate, these inequalities between people can be reduced. So we're not so happy about this. So we had a certain amount of criticism, as you might imagine, from these, uh, this analysis. So these are the objections. Well, this is racist. Yes, I suppose it is. So, all right, it's racist, yes. Well, there are, well, there are, you know, we are talking about facts here, not ideology. There are these race differences in intelligence, well understood. Uh, they have a genetic basis. There are race differences in brain size, for example, which are exactly the same as these race differences in IQs. The mongoloid peoples have the largest brains than the Europeans, and brain size decreased, and brain size is one of the uh, contributors. Your IQ, if you have a big brain, you get a higher IQ. So that's one objection, and then the others, uh, another objection is the IQs are questionable, the data are questionable. So this is what you might call nitpicking objections. Someone would say, well, look, this IQ you got for Indonesia, 84. Now that's all derived from one city in Indonesia. It's a big country of 120 million. How can you be sure that this city is representative of the total population of Indonesia? So all I can say is, well, why shouldn't it be? Uh, well, you can't say much more than that. So they, the critics nitpick these various things. You can go through them all and question this one and that one. The other, you know, they say they oh, this is all rubbish. This stuff, you know. But we were lucky here. We were extremely lucky because after we published this book in 2002, the OECD, Organisation of Economic uh, Something and Development, a well-respected body, perhaps not among us here so much, but uh, nevertheless a reputable body, took it upon themselves to study the uh, educational achievement, as they called it, in a number of countries, 108 in all. These studies came out in 2003 and 2005, after we published our book. And they studied the 15-year-olds, very well-drawn samples in all these countries, in uh, reading comprehension, in mathematics comprehension, and in science comprehension. And these are really IQ tests, or they're very, well, according to this, in my view, they're really IQ tests, or they're very, very close to IQ tests. There's no real distinction between an IQ test which contains in it items of this kind and these educational tests. These educational tests are curriculum free. They measure general understanding of the principles, not of whether you happen to have studied calculus in one country, or another. The object of this was to see which countries do better than others and then try and figure out why this would be. Does it depend on the size of the classes or the qualifications of the teachers? We could look at all these things. You know, then we could find out why some schools do better, some countries do better and others do worse. And the ones that don't do so well can copy these ones. They can reduce their class size or train their teachers better or something. So they produced all this for 108 nations. So what I had to do was to look at these and look at them in relation to the high IQ data. 
And the results are exactly the same. There's a correlation of one across these countries. So this validates our IQ data and confounds our critics. So uh, we think we've uh, really established now as we have these two totally different lines of evidence on these IQ differences between peoples. Uh, this must now be accepted as a fact that our leftist friends will have to come to terms with. Of course, they will find it painful to do so with their aspirations for an equal world. But nevertheless, eventually, uh, I think the evidence is so strong, both between nations here and within nations, that they will come to accept this, that uh, it will take some time, but eventually they will come to accept this because the truth triumphs in the end, or as our ancestors in medieval Europe used to say, magna est veritas et praevalebit. <coughs> Thank you, gentlemen and ladies. Thank <laughs> you.